Hello, I'm Robert and I'm from Doomsday Debunked, the Facebook group where we help people by fact-checking the stories that they're scared of. So this time I'm going to show you how you check whether there are any asteroid warnings. So we get these constant asteroid warnings every week, probably more often than that, in the Daily Express just saying that one asteroid after another, they choose a harmless asteroid and they say it's going to hit Earth. And they just lie. There's no, there's no other word for it. They say that NASA has issued a warning when they haven't. They write to thrill and entertain. They do not write to inform. So, uh, first of all, if you just go to this page, I've done the uh, part of the reason why they are able to do that is because NASA have a very techy page, and if you go and look at that, then it'll just it's just bewildering to most people, just a mass of numbers, and they don't know what these things mean. So I have done a non-techy version of it, which says exactly the same thing. And so if you just go and visit that, it says there are no asteroid or comic warnings, all those tracked are harmless to Earth. So NASA is currently not tracking anything that is uh, is any warning. This does not cover things that they haven't tracked. So there are always the possibility that some especially very small asteroid can hit without warning but uh, those are also they are uh, similar but much less likely than being hit by hailstone say people do get killed very very rarely by hailstones it's extraordinarily rare for anyone to be killed by an asteroid though it does happen for to a handful of people per century for the very, very small ones that break up and then bits fall down and very occasionally, it's very, very occasionally, and the Tunguska one, and then there were the people who were injured by glass in Chelyabinsk. So it does happen but your risk is so, so small and those can hit without warning. But the, uh, but the sensationist press stories you see are always about asteroids that they claim that NASA has said they're going to hit. So if the story says an asteroid is going to hit Earth, you go here, you look at this page, and it says no asteroid or comet warnings, so the story is a lie. And NASA hasn't issued any warning. Now, if you want to search for a particular object, then you can go there, and, and, it, and you enter the name of the object, 2006 SF6. This was a recent one that they claimed was about to hit Earth and it was not found in the Sentry database and it was not found as a removed object because it's not a removed object this means that it was never in there so it's not like they, the NASA that was even in the risk list in the risk list doesn't mean it's a warning it just means they're monitoring it but these they weren't even monitoring it with any possibility of it hitting Earth there never was even the remotest possibility of this one hitting Earth and then you need to check, you may need to check that you enter the name correctly and it, this, this, it almost certainly will be in that one. It mightn't be in the east page. So you go there and you will find, there it is, and there are lots of techie details but you don't need to, uh, they, they won't really mean much. The just main thing is uh, that you want to check that, it's, uh, that you've got the name right. So it's a real genuine asteroid and it's completely harmless. It never was even considered as a possibility for hitting Earth. It's a complete lie. So, the other things that you can have are, it can be a removed object, so I'll just take the very first one in the list. So, if you get that, okay, if it's a removed object, then you will say it was removed from the database, and this was removed on the 9th of uh, November, so many of them were removed very quickly, it was discovered in 2019, and then removed almost immediately. So that happens as well, that they find an object, and then as they, and to start with, they don't know its orbit very well. The orbit doesn't, the object doesn't change, but the, uh, the, the asteroids barely move just by tiny smidgens as a result of uh, the uh, effect of solar heating and stuff. It's not because of the objects moving that these things change, is because when you first spot it, you only have you have one op one uh, observation there, another observation there, 
and then there'll be you know this kind of thick splodge, thick splodge, and it could be could be like that, or it could be like that. You know, you're not sure where, where where the line goes between those two points, and so that's why they don't know to start with. And as they find more and more points dotted out over a longer period of t uh, time and in sp space in the sky, then they get it more and more accurate, and so uh, and then they they show once they know its orbit very well, then they can prove that it's that there's, there's no possibility of it hitting Earth. So this is one of those. Then finally, it might be one that that they're still they're still tracking as a, as a possibility. And Apophis is an example. This is an old one that uh, the the sensationist press keep bringing out Apophis again and again and again. And it was all over with way back in um, 2004, as far as the astronomers were concerned. The sensationist press keep on digging up ancient stories from 2004 and running them again. So uh, this, uh, the, it, it's now known it can't hit in 2029, it can't hit in 2036. The first date it could hit is 2060, but the odds against it hit are 10 million to 1. This means they expect it to miss then as well. Now, this is the one, if you ever hear about gravitational keyholes and about the Yarkovsky effect, then this is this one that they're talking about. This, when, in 2000, let's bring that up, and you can have a look. In 2029, it's going to come extremely close to Earth, but it's still a long way away. See the diameter of the Earth? This is to scale. It's several Earth diameters away, and that is how precisely they know it. So they do absolutely certainly can't hit Earth in 2029. And this is not actually the position, that's more the distance. Let's give a better idea of the position it's going like that. These are the geostationary orbit and it's just skimming around them and actually getting closer to the geostationary orbit. Now when and as can you can probably see there how its orbit is actually changing shape as it goes past Earth. Now if if it was moved just a little bit slightly bit that way, then this will be exaggerated. I'll exaggerate what it does. So say it was coming like that. It might go like that, you see, not, not as exaggerated as much as that. And if it was going there, it might go more or less straight. Now, it's not as much, I'm exaggerating that. But uh, but there's a kind of, uh, uh, um, as you go around close to Earth, then the tiny changes in position are amplified and become huge changes in direction afterwards, comparatively. Like if it's changed by a centimetre there, it would be you know, maybe metres there or something eventually. So uh, it would go on long enough. And so it turns out that if you shift it by just, I think it's 200 metres there, it's shifted by several times the diameter of the Earth, way back next encounter, a decade later. So that is what's called the gravitational keyhole. Little region, it had to go through, I'm not sure which side of this line it is, it had to go through this little keyhole region in order to hit Earth in 2036, in order to have a chance of hitting Earth in 2036. And, it, and as they found out the orbit more and more exactly, they proved they would miss this tiny keyhole that's only 200 metres or so in diameter. So that is what a gravitational keyhole is. And the sensationalist press talk as if this gravitational keyhole can just ping up anywhere in space, that are, that are, as if an asteroid sort of uh, uh, six billion miles away from Earth could suddenly go through a gravitational keyhole, keyhole and the next thing you know it's headed straight for Earth. It doesn't work like that. It's only for this very, very special case of an asteroid that goes very close to Earth. And that's because the Earth's gravity changes quickly. It's, it's uh, almost the same with the ISS, but it gets much weaker there. It goes down as the square of the distance. So from there to there, from there it would be a quarter of the, of, of the Earth's gravity, of the surface gravity, and there, there would be an eighth and so on. So there's big changes in gravity happening there. So it's no surprising that, that you get quite a big change in the path because if it's a little bit closer, it gets more gravity affecting it. A bit further away, it gets less. So it gets curved less. That's gravitational keyhole. But if it's a million miles away, it's not going to change much at all, even if it's shifted by 
not just hundreds of metres, by hundreds of kilometres, it's still going to be uh, not going to make any difference as far as Earth's gravity is concerned. So that's why you can only get a gravitational keyhole if it's very close, past, very close to Earth. In theory, you could also have a gravitational keyhole, keyhole if it was passing very close to, say, Mars or Venus or Jupiter. But the ones of most importance to us are the ones that, when it's passing very close to Earth, because ones that do regular regular flybys of Earth are the ones that are most likely to be near Earth objects that have a chance of eventually hitting us. Then you also get the Yarkovsky effect. The Yarkovsky effect is a very, very subtle effect. As the asteroid spins, on, uh, all, nearly all asteroids are spinning uh, quite fast. And as, but it doesn't even matter, even if it wasn't spinning, then the sunlight from the Earth, reflected by that, absorbed by the asteroid, and then re-emitted back towards the Sun, gives a gentle push outwards, and it causes asteroids to spiral outwards. The, the various other effects that cause them to move in different ways. But the Yarkovsky effect makes them spiral outwards. Then, if an asteroid is spinning, then the Yarkovsky effect works in another way. Then, if it's spinning this way, forward into its thing, the Yarkovsky effect will work to slow it down in its orbit. If it's going the other way, it works to speed it up. And this um, changes the position of the orbit as well, in a rather unintuitive way. I won't go into details, but the main, the main point is that, so if it's spinning, the thing is that if it's, if, it's, if it's spinning like that, say, then the heat comes there, and then it heats up the sun, the asteroid, it spins round into the night side of the asteroid, and it'll radiate the heat in the night side, uh, quite a lot of the heat in the night side, which then uh, send off the Yarkovsky effect, uh, pushing that way, or as it, head, as it goes towards the night side. Uh, some of it will be coming already, right at the beginning. It radiates away quite quickly. So it's still being pushed outwards, but it's pushed outwards and backwards, or it can be pushed outwards and forwards, depending on which way the asteroid is spinning. As you can imagine, that is a very, very weak effect. It can build up to, I think, tens of kilometres in a decade. That's not going to cause an asteroid to swerve by millions of miles and suddenly hit Earth. And again, the sensationalist press suggests that the Yarkovsky effect is almost like a Star, Star Trek, what you call it, the, the, uh, the drive that they do inside planetary systems, not, this, not the warp drive, the other one. Uh, Oh, the name escapes me for now. But you know, it's, it's almost like a Star Trek uh, spaceship sort of going zooming back and forth in the solar system. It's not like that. It's just a minutest effect. Minutest effect. And it's only relevant to uh, the... Uh, to Again, it's only relevant if it's going through a keyhole. Because if it goes through a keyhole, then those 200 metres, that's an amount that it could be moved by, or more than that by the Yarkovsky effect. So they calibrate the Yarkovsky effect by observing um, asteroids like Apophis and they work out what it is and what it's doing to its orbit. And then they can predict it a long way in advance. And if they don't know the Yarkovsky effect, then that introduces an uncertainty. But it's not going to make any difference at all unless the asteroid is going to come very close to Earth. And then it'll only make a difference not for that flyby, but for the one after that. Because I'd say even then, you know, unless it was really literally skimming the Earth's atmosphere or something like that, you know, a few tens of kilometers is just tiny, it's the size of a city. Just it's, it's not you won't even see it. It's not even a pixel in this, in this in this scale. That's that's the amount. I mean, the Yarkovsky effect will not move this asteroid by more than a, as much as a pixel at this at this uh, resolution. Much less than a pixel. And so, as you can imagine, it's not, it's not, it's not, not going to change. A missile to a hidden is practically skimming in the Earth's atmosphere. So, so you don't need to worry about the Yarkovsky effect. It's, it's a highly technical thing that, that the journalists grabbed a hold of because of this. It's just so striking that, that, yeah, that such a thing could make a difference to the motion of Apophis. And, um, and it was because of the gravitational keyhole. And it also makes a difference if you're looking at asteroids over millions of years. 
that ex helps explain how asteroids and the asteroid belt can eventually hit each other because they're spiraling very slowly, very, very slowly out or very, very slowly in and um, causing different effects and, and these can cause them to hit each other and the small asteroids and uh, so that there are, and that's another thing if you start thinking they talk about one asteroid hitting another that is extremely rare the vast numbers of asteroids in the asteroid belt and I think we've only seen one instance of one of them hitting another a small one that was too small to see hitting a bigger one so uh, and again I mean they know they know all the big ones going you know the if they're falling uh, well I don't know what I was going to say there Yes, there's asteroids. Um, you, you don't need to worry about asteroids hit, being hit by other asteroids either. That's just uh, a too 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 small thing to worry about. Uh, that's that's it. But though asteroids hitting other asteroids could be useful for deflecting them in the future. There's uh, one study that I I looked at, which looked at uh, a possibility. If we wanted to deflect an asteroid, we've got normally if if we ever find an asteroid is going to hit Earth, it's extremely unlikely that it will be in the next decade or so, unless it's a very small one. Because we get hit by small ones every like Chelyabinsk or the Targuska one every century or so, but the bigger ones, it's thousands of years. The small the between hits, and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and we just possibly might have a larger one. Um, that would hit in the next few millennia, say. So, uh, if, if yes, uh, and in fact, I've got I've got it there under Apophis. Did I go up Apophis? Yes. So I've got a thing down here. Uh, it's about ninety-four thousand years between impacts of an object about the size of Apophis. So uh, that is not just of this particular one, but of any asteroid that size. So chances are that we don't get anything as big as Apophis hitting us for um, you know, getting on for the next 100,000 years. So uh, it's not a high probability event. So you can see that if by chance we just happen to get an asteroid that big, that is it able to hit us. And this is not big enough for global effects. It's, it's too small for global effects. If we look up here, um, where does it say? No global effects at this size. And uh, uh, global effects, if it's big enough for global effects, again, that doesn't mean like rocks hitting the earth everywhere. That means things like uh, a bit of dust flying up in the air and and making and shading the earth a bit. At one kilometre, you start to get enough dust in the higher upper atmosphere being thrown up to um, cool the earth, um, cool the earth for a little bit, a, a smidgen, a few degrees for a few weeks, which of course has an effect on crops if it happens to be during a crop growing season. So that's much bigger than Apophis, that's much rarer that you get that. So anyway, so we're not likely to, it's exceedingly unlikely as they continue to find more asteroids, they find something as big as Apophis that's going to hit this century. So the most likely would be a few centuries in the future. And uh, and if it is this century it would be most likely to be several decades. So it's not, it's not it's exceedingly unlikely that we have one just about to hit us and we, we don't have much warning. So if you've got several, several decades of warning, then there are lots of ways that you can deflect it. And for instance, going back to our office, if it goes through a keyhole, and often it will go through a keyhole because if it's a, um, a risky, if it's one that, uh, does, uh, that has a chance of hitting us, then most likely it does several flybys before it hits. So one of those previous flybys, it would have a keyhole, like Apophis. So then, like Apophis, Apophis is so easy to deflect that you could get, I think it's 200 metres by 200 metres, something like that. I think I give the figures here. Um, 225 by 225 square metres of solid sail type mirror material. Very, very thin. Very thin, thin just, just uh, micron thick material, but reflective. And, and just lay that over, over its surface. And that would be enough if you put it in the right place to change the Yarkovsky effect enough so that it would change a, a mist to a hit like a decade or two later. So this is very, the hypothesis is very, very easy to deflect 
if it's going through a flight path from Kiel. Like if going through 2029, we could get a, a mission, and we saw it in 2036, we go through a keyhole for 2060, then we could send a mission to put this on it, in, in, as if it were passing 2000, or maybe a little bit later, so it would so, so we miss the keyhole in 2036. So that's the sort of thing you can do, or you can, and you can also um, nudge it with at that size and give an all time between 2036 and 2060, then you could just nudge it and just a, just by a very, very tiny, tiny amount, and it would then miss in 2060. So you can do that just with using, for instance, the uh, Falcon Heavy for SpaceX, which they will send quite a big heavy mass into orbit now. That's the one that sent the Tesla motor into space uh, in direction of Mars, not to Mars, but in that direction. And uh, the, we, we could send quite a large mass and get it to hit Apophis at quite, quite some quite speed. And the various other ways of ways we can do it. We, we, we don't need to worry about Apophis. We'll, we'll be able to fix that. And, uh, and any other asteroid of this size, it's likely to be decades or centuries in the future. The uh, only one of one kilo out of the 95%, we found 95% of the ones of one kilometer which are just large enough for some global effects. And of those, only one is still in the list. The others have all been removed that they found so far. And there may be a few more still to be found, but most likely, given that we found well over 900 and there's only one, and then we've got a few dozen left to find, it's not likely that one of those has a risk of hitting Earth, even centuries into the future. And, uh, and the largest we expect to find is 3.5 kilometers, which is large enough to have significant global effects, but in, in terms of the weather, but not, it's not going to be like the dinosaur one at that size. Uh, half the size, the dinosaur one was 10 kilometers, half the size is an eighth of the, of the mass. And 3.5 kilometers is you know, like about a third of the size, which means, on, or even a tenth, of, on, not quite a tenth, maybe an eighth of the, uh, would be, or three, yeah, is, uh, that would be about a, uh, 20th or sort of the mass or something, I don't know, 20th or 30th or something. So, 30th mass, I don't know, I, I could, could bring it up. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I can bring it up, you know, 10 over 30.5. The bar 3, 23. So, at 3.5 kilometers, it's, a, it's less than a twentieth of the mass of the dinosaur one, and that is the largest. That could be the, the, that's about the largest one we haven't found yet, and the uh, <coughs> and that's and that's. I mean, it's it, it, given that out of nine hundred, you know, we only find one that had a chance a century from now, and you can see that the, that it's not very likely at all that that, that has any chance. So it's um, we. It, a remote possibility we find another one kilometer asteroid, like 1950DA, which is the one we already know about. Which 1950DA uh, DA has a very small chance of hitting in 2880, but it's expected to miss. So, uh, and that's loads of time to deflect it. And at one kilometer again, I mean, you, you can deflect one kilometer things because remember, it's just a just very, very small nudge makes a huge difference in decades later. You, you don't need nuclear weapons. It's very unlikely that we need any nuclear weapons to defend Earth. If the, uh, if the Egyptians had had nuclear weapons and ready to fire up to hit asteroids, they would just be sitting in the silos rusting because they wouldn't have had anything to fire it at. And if we have some, then they'd be like to be rusting there for tens, hundreds of thousands of years. So it doesn't make sense to build an asteroid defense system. What makes sense is to uh, have more and more telescopes. That's what they're doing. And uh, prioritize, and we're going to have lots of them in the early 20th century. And what would make a huge difference as well is to have some more space, very small space telescopes, because they can look in the infrared, which we can't do from the Earth very easily. And in the infrared, you can spot dark asteroids that are a little bit harder to see on the Earth. You can see them all. The moon is very dark. And although it looks bright to us, it's actually a very dark rock, like asphalt. So you get asteroids that are as dark as the moon, or even darker. And they're much easier to see 
with an infrared telescope in orbit that can be really quite small. And so, uh, and, they, and especially also ones that approach us from the direction of the sun. So, uh, 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 but we will find nearly all the, the big space Earth based telescopes are, do, are going to be doing a big job of finding lots of the small ones. And we're building more and more of those. And hopefully someday we get this, uh, uh, this orbital one. It's not a lot, not by compared with defense budgets, say. And you're not talking about even the cost of a destroyer or, or a nuclear submarine. It's nowhere near that cost. You're talking about um, tens of millions of dollars. It's, a, it's sort of lottery winner cost for to, to get a space telescope. The two things we can do, we can make an early warning system which will spot any, any asteroids coming from the direction of the sun with a couple of days warning. And the other thing we can do is to have a, a telescope, a t telescopes that would most likely orbit between the Earth and Venus so they can look outwards and spot uh, the hardest to spot asteroids that are between our orbit and Venus's orbit, that's towards the Sun. And then these, those ones then, they um, would very quickly fill in our knowledge of the smallest asteroids. And so if you're really concerned about about um, asteroid uh, asteroids, especially in the smaller, especially the smaller ones, then lobby your your uh, local uh, decision makers, but local government uh, representatives, and say uh, we would like the government to build uh, to finance a space telescope to look for these things. Please. Uh, Please build one less nuclear sub and hundreds of space telescopes, dozens of space telescopes, you know, or you know, for, for the price of, of, of one one uh, Trident missile or something. Probably, I don't know. Don't think you'd get many Trident missiles for fifty million dollars. Anyway, so but 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 you, these uh, so yeah yeah so the uh, it's you really these are just fake news, fake 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 news. And NASA has never issued any asteroid warnings, ever. They would have for the Chelyabinsk one, but they missed it. And remember, most of Earth, we expect the small asteroids are far more likely to hit us. And the very small ones are sadly the, more, the hardest to, to detect. And they can, um, very small ones, like this one that killed some people in Mexico last century, a handful of people in a hamlet, and there's, there's occasional people from time to time get, get killed by very small ones. And then the, the Tunguska one, then that um, hit in a very remote place in Siberia, and that killed three reindeer herders and a herd of reindeer. And that is, if, if th that sort of thing, we can, uh, with, as we find out more of these small asteroids, we can save these people in the future. If we had uh, better, we had our telescopes and we kept them going for a bit longer, like by the 2030s, then we would be able to say to the, uh, to say to, uh, send warnings to Siberia and say, warn your reindeer herders, this thing is going to hit exactly at you know, 2042 on such and such a date, you know, such and such a time on such and such a date, no, 1908, I don't know what time date, date it actually was for that one, I could look it up. But we, we would have a warning and saying, "Reindeer herders, watch out! You know, don't go into this area on that day." And you wouldn't need to deflect it. You know, just tell them to stay away. And then you'd have all the keen astronomers in, in their jets flying over and uh, chartering a, de a jet to go and watch this from the air and taking scientific measurements of what happens. But it's actually far more likely to hit in the sea. And so, if you ask me to predict what is the next, the most likely next asteroid prediction, then by far the most likely NASA asteroid prediction would be a very small asteroid that is going to splosh harmlessly into the Pacific or in the Atlantic. At that size it would be too small to cause a tsunami, even an ordinary tsunami. It has to be quite big even to cause the very small ones, in fact, they would just cause a, cause a, just kind of flatten out, pick up in the atmosphere and just kind of flatten, so sort of push down on the surface of the ocean of a large area and really do nothing. And then a little bit larger than that, then they c 
create a rather magnificent splosh where the asteroid goes into the sea and then a huge, you know like if, if you drop a pebble into a, a, into a pond and you get a kind of, um, a ripple comes and then if you look with slow motion you get a little water drop that comes up in the middle. That would happen with this asteroid but a much huger scale. And you get the shark, you get the, the you get the splash curtain which goes up. Like if you've seen these pictures, we have a little like almost like a little crown around the edge. That would happen but on a far scale, hundred meters high or something. And the and two hundred meters high for this central splosh up in the air. And then it also splashes out. But it doesn't create a tsunami at that size. It's not it's not even an ordinary tsunami. Never mind a mega tsunami. For a tsunami the reason a mega tsunami is so destructive is because you get like a hundred kilometers of the ocean floor moves up or down suddenly as a result of an earthquake by a meter or two or something. And when that happens, it creates a wave on the surface which goes up, which is very, very long wavelength, hundred kilometers long. You're not going to get such a big tsunami, and you're not going to get a proper tsunami like that unless your asteroid itself is getting on for that size. 10 kilometer asteroid or something. And for the small 20, uh, 20 meter asteroid, it can't make a tsunami. It can only make a little sploshy wave. And if it gets a little bit bigger, it can make a somewhat larger wave. It might be 100 meters or something. It might be you know, 200 meters, but it's not got the wavelength. So what happens is that as it comes into shore, then um, the, the leading bit of the wave comes, it builds up, and then the the backward bit of it comes and it just sort of um, it goes down again and it just splashes over and it's not going to go very far in, in land. But if you've got a mega tsunami then you've got a hundred kilometers of this coming in so the leading bit comes in and goes up and then there's, there's nothing coming unlike a normal wave it just stays up and there's more coming and there's more coming and there's more coming it goes further and further inland and that's what makes a tsunami so destructive and that doesn't happen with small asteroids. All you get is a splosh. And then for the somewhat larger ones, if it lands in shallow water, like for instance, say, the uh, Chinese Sea near to Japan, then it would, uh, China Sea, I think that's called China Sea, isn't it? The one between Japan and China? Whatever it is, close to Japan, that shallow sea, it's rather shallow sea. And if it was close to Japan, then it would create, a, it would still create this splosh. But, so in order to have a tsunami that travels, then the wave, has to have a larger wavelength than the depth of the sea. In fact, I think it's several times the depth of the sea that it's, that it's traveling over in order for it to be able to keep going like a tsunami. And if it's, if it's, if it's got a, lower, a smaller wavelength or comparable wavelength to the depth of the sea, then it, it very quickly dissipates. Just like ripples in a pond, it starts with a big wave, but as it goes out, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And that would happen to a normal wave. And it's only when you, the mega tsunami, that's the, also the reason why it can travel so far across an ocean without getting very small, is because it's so big. It's much, it's several times, many times, the depth of the ocean. And for that reason, it can travel and travel and travel and travel. And there's nothing to, to kind of make it dissipate. And so, uh, again, uh, this splosh, you get a, a big splosh, let's say, 100 metres high splash curtain, and then would come down and it would create a significant wave. If you were nearby on the boat, you'd have a huge wave rolling towards you, but, but it, would, it would just quickly dissipate and it wouldn't travel very far. And it's not even metres, centimetres you're talking about before it gets, unless it's very, very close to the shore. So, uh, so unless, unless the, the asteroid is very big, and even the biggest one, even like Apophis, then I think it only, if, as far as I remember, it only, in fact I've got a thing here about it, I think it only creates, um, does it say there, uh, that one, yes, Apophis is not big enough for proper tsunami. It's one that doesn't come far inland like a storm surge. But, uh, if it is to see nearby coastline, coastal area regions may need to be evacuated. So I explain about that there. So, uh, but that is part. Uh, but that's a ninety-four, getting on for one in a hundred thousand years event, and the most likely thing we're going to have this century could be far too small even to have that. So, so there's no. I say we, we just the most likely thing is just a harmless splosh in the ocean, and. Uh, because most of the Earth's surface, 
1% of the Earth's surface is ocean. So that's by far, far, far the most likely uh, asteroid thing. It's, it, um, it's either an ocean, or it's a desert, or it's an um, ice sheet, or it's forest. And then eventually, then you've got the agricultural land. And then eventually, if you talk about urban areas, that's only 1%. So if we have an asteroid in fact, we don't really know how often it is that we have something the same size as the Chalabinsk or Tunguska, because the problem is that people just don't keep records of this, and it's not very. There's, there's almost nothing left on the ground after an impact like that, and like a century later. I mean, imagine trying to find evidence of the Chelyabinsk impact a century from now if you didn't know it was there. It happened, and uh, so the. They don't really know, and they have these the, the two estimates using small craters on the moon and looking at the at various evidence on the Earth and things. But they, they don't really know very well the frequency of the very smallest ones. Then, and then they do looking at the ones that fly past us and see how many of them are different sizes. But the so but they're still not entirely sure how often we get the very smallest ones. So it might be 80 years, it might be a century, it might, they, they come up with different things depending on the different papers say different things. But say it was every 80 years that we get one of about that size. And then we, for every single one that hits an urban area, actually hits it rather than just being a bit of way away and you may get some broken glass, then that would be every, uh, that would be one in a hundred, so maybe in the next 8,000 years, we might on average get one of those smaller impacts that would actually hit an urban area and create a tiny, it may, may be probably too small for a crater. We knocked down a few buildings. And if it, and if, if it was a really bad angle, then it could actually, you know, be, you could actually even get the actual fireball of the asteroid coming down close to the ground. And that could be quite serious. But, uh, you know, for, for that little local area. So, I mean, it's not impossible. But it's extremely, extremely, you know, that's not something that's, that's you know, that you, that you need to worry about. And uh, and so they, uh, we, we do, but it's, it is important. So I, I, I think that we should, that we should definitely look, it's very good that they're looking for these things. But it's, it's not, it's nothing, your personal risk is nothing like even your personal risk for hailstorm. The reason it's worth doing is because we've got so many people in the world. We've got these over 7 billion people. With 7 billion people, and if you can afford nuclear submarines, surely you can afford little telescopes in orbit to look for these asteroids, even if it's only chances are that it's only going to be a risk for some uh, Siberian reindeer herders, but you don't know for sure that there's, you know, there's a tiny chance that it could be more than that. And uh, and the... Uh, so. No, I, I think it is good that we're searching for these things, but it's not something that you need to worry about. And the really big ones, they're, they're kind of ruled out. And anyway, so there you are.